Genesis chapter 8, and we are going to read the entirety of this passage. You know, I like to share with you the providences of, of God and see the outworking of the, the providence of God in, in our lives and in the preaching ministry here in the church. I believe firmly that this is, is a passage that God has for each and every one of us who are here this evening. I had the, the points, seven of them, I think, six or, or seven of them, in the middle of May, no, end of May, for a sermon that, that I hope to preach one Sabbath. I, I wanted to preach it. There were people in the congregation who were suffering. It was so applicable, but in the providence of God, he, he prevented that sermon from being preached. And in hindsight, I see the, the, the providence of God in different ways in, in that since then, we've had two deaths in the congregation. This is Ross and, and John McNeil, Andrew's father. We have had sickness and, and pain. We have had disappointment. We've seen tragedy in, in ways maybe that most of you haven't been, been aware of in, in people's lives. And I believe that God has postponed when I wanted to preach this sermon for you here this evening. He knew your mom would fall this morning and, and be in the royal. And that's one of the, the providences, I believe. He knew you'd be here after the disappointment of this week. I know some of your pains, some of the pains you've been suffering in these past weeks. This is God's word to his people this evening. Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 to 22. We begin our, our reading at verse 1. The flood is, has fallen 40 days, 40 nights of rain, and then God breaks into this passage. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens were restrained. And the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the flood had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And again, he sent forth the ark, the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening. And behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove. And she did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps in the earth, that you may swarm, or that, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. 
So Noah went out, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Amen. This is the infallible word of our faithful God. Amen. Please keep that passage open in front of you as we come to, to look this evening at verses 1 to, to 20 in particular of this passage of God's word. We, we use water all the time as, as a picture or a, a metaphor for difficult situations, troubling situations. When we're experiencing something difficult, we'll say things like, I'm in really deep water. I'm, I'm up to my neck in it just now. I'm, I'm out of my depth. I'm struggling to stay afloat. I'm, I'm drowning in, in work, in the pressure of work. I'm just about keeping my head above water. Lots of, of little phrases that we use that, that, that use water to, to, as a picture or a metaphor of, of troubling, difficult circumstances. And we find this very same language in the Bible. Water uses as a picture of hard, painful circumstances. In Isaiah 43, verse 2, a passage we looked at this time last year, having described the punishment that he's bringing on Judah, God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Water being, being used, the language of water being used as a picture of a difficult situation. Psalm 66, verse 12, the writer, again, talking about a difficult situation that he had experienced, he says, we went through fire and water. We went through fire and water. Describing heaven, John writes in, in Revelation 21 and verse 1, I saw a new heaven and, and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. The sea was no more. John, now John isn't saying, we saw this in our study a few years ago of Revelation, John isn't saying there will be no sea, no water in heaven. He's saying that what the sea represents, no crisis, storms, chaos, painful situations, those things will not be in heaven. The Bible uses water as a picture, a metaphor of painful, difficult circumstances. And here in Genesis 7 and 8, in the flood that, that God brings into the world, the flood that he brings into the life of his child. It's not just the, the wicked world out there that went through the flood. Noah, his child, he brought this flood into the life of his child. Here in this flood, we have a picture of the floods. The deep water, the storms that God at times brings into the lives of his people. We saw a number of weeks ago that the flood, yes, it's a picture of God's judgment at the end of time and the, his means of, of bringing his people through that flood, that judgment. But it is also a picture of the floods, the storms that he brings into his people's lives in our lifetime. The deep waters of sickness, of sorrow, of stress, of pressure, problems, pain, difficulties, devastation, and death. And here in this flood, in Noah's actions in the flood, in God's actions in the flood, God himself is preparing us. He's equipping us 
to face these storms. So this evening, we're going to look at, at this chapter under the title, Coming Through the Water. And we're going to highlight some of the things that we see here in this chapter that it teaches us to help us face the storms of life. And the first thing we see here is God's personal involvement. God's personal involvement. God caused the flood that Noah faced, but that wasn't his only involvement uh, with the flood. He didn't bring it and then back away and fold his arms, as it were, and stand in, in heaven and just leave Noah to cope with it all on his own. No. We're told in, in verse 1, God remembered Noah. God remembered Noah. As he faced the floodwaters, God remembered him. And as we saw last time, when the Bible says God re remembered, it doesn't mean that, that God called to mind in his head something he'd forgotten, something that, that he, he had slipped out of his mind some time ago. It doesn't mean that because God can't forget. He doesn't forget. It doesn't mean a mere recollection of facts or people he had forgotten. When the Bible speaks about God remembering, it's speaking in human terms about God. It's ascribing human qualities to God, lowering God, as it were, bringing God down to our level, as it were, so that we can understand more of the greatness of our God. And when we remember, we act on, on what we remember, what comes into our mind, the people, the situations that we've forgotten. We, we act on them. And when the Bible says God remembered, the emphasis isn't on the remembering, but acting in remembrance, acting or intervening in a situation of which he is continuously aware, changing that situation, acting in, in a person's life of whom he is endlessly, perpetually conscious, acting in, in their life, enabling them, equipping them, strengthening, strengthening them in that situation. And that's what Moses is saying here in verse 1 when he writes, God remembered Noah. God acted towards Noah in his constant consciousness of him and his situation. He intervened. He acted to bring the flood to an end. And he acted in Noah, equipping him to face the flood, giving him the grace, giving him the strength, giving him the, the patience, the faith that he needed to face it. God was personally involved, constantly. And friends, that personal involvement in Noah's situation, in the flood that he brought into Noah's life, is a personal involvement that he has in the lives of all his people in every crisis, every flood, every painful situation that he asks us to walk through. He doesn't bring difficult situations into our lives and, and then stand back and hold his arms and, and leave, leave us on our own to face them alone. He remembers you. He remembers you in those situations. He is continuously aware of you and acting in his perpetual remembrance of you, constantly overseeing, constantly intervening, constantly at work in you, equipping, enabling, strengthening, giving you every grace you need. Every grace you need in the situation that he's called you into. Child of God, you are not on your own. You are never on your own. God is always there, personally involved with you in every situation of life. God's personal involvement. The second thing that we see here is God's power. God's power. You know, it, it's good. It, it's wonderful knowing that, that God is with us and God remembers us in every difficult, painful situation. It's good knowing that, that God is constantly acting and intervening in those situations and in us. But that doesn't mean a lot if God can't do very much. Sure it doesn't. If he can't change the situation very much. If he can't equip you very much in that situation, his presence with you 
really doesn't mean very much. But chapter 8 here reminds us of God's power. Reminds us of God's power. In verse 2, look at verse 2. We're told in, in verse 2, the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. You know, those huge underground subterranean reservoirs that were pumping millions of gallons of water out onto the surface of the world. The rain that had been falling for 40 days and 40 nights stopped. Stopped. Verse 1, we're told a wind blew over the earth and the waters subsided. We read it and we move on to verse 3. But who controlled these mighty forces of nature? Who did? God did. And powerful as these so-called forces of nature are, they do not, they cannot act independently of God. They do nothing apart from what God wills and directs. And here, remembering Noah, intervening in Noah's situation and in his constant awareness of him, God exercises his almighty sovereign power to take away the cause of the flood in Noah's life. To stop the storm. And friends, the very same God who acted in sovereign power in his personal involvement in Noah's situation is the same God who is personally involved in the lives of all his children. In every storm, every flood, he asks you to walk through. The Almighty, think, think about this. The Almighty, omnipotent, sovereign God for whom nothing is impossible, is personally involved with us in our storms. Can he calm the storm in your life right now? Can he? Yes, he can. Can he intervene to ease or remove the thing that you're facing, you're finding so difficult, so painful right now? Can he bring to an end the animosity that has been shown towards you? Can he remove maybe the tension or the friction in, in your family or with friends? Can he restore your broken body? Can he restore and heal your broken mind, your broken heart? Yes, he can. Can he give you what you need to endure it? To face it? Can he give you the grace to face another pressure-filled week? To go in tomorrow and sit across a desk for a demanding boss from colleagues who bear you ill will and ill grace? Can he give you the grace to live with the physical pain that you're in tonight? Can he? He can. Of course he can. Chapter 8 is one long reminder of the power of God over the storms of life. His power to end those storms. His power to give you the grace to face those storms. To equip you to ride them out. God's power. God's personal involvement, God's power. The third thing we see here is God's program. God's program. We're reminded here in this passage that God does things on his own schedule, on his own time. The only timetable that God works to is his own. You know, in, in chapter 7, we, we read that, that water exploded from underneath the, the surface of, of the world from those huge subterranean reservoirs Rain fell from the heavens 40 days and 40 nights that rain fell and the water gushed out onto the surface of the world until the whole surface of the world was covered. The highest mountains covered to a depth of 20 feet. And then in verse 2, it stopped. Verse 2 of chapter 8, the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. But the flood didn't end there. The water that had taken... I say only, but the water that had taken only 40 days and 40 nights to cover the earth took 11 whole months to recede and dry out. Noah had to endure 11 months in the confines of that dark and 
little, I know it was huge, but little compared to, to the ability to, to go out and about and, and dander around the world. A little dark confined space, 11 months, four months floating on an endless expanse of water, seven months grounded in the mountains of Ararat, all the while watching their little supply of food slowly deplete away. Now, God could have reversed the, the flood in a half of the time. He could have reversed the flood in, in a quarter of the time. He could have reversed the flood in a day. You know, in, in Genesis chapter 1, two days, the second day of creation, the third day of creation, we see him separating vast expanses of, of water in a day. The second day, the, the water above the, 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 uh, the, the expanse from the, the water below the expanse, separated completely. Third day of creation, he separated the, wonder, the water under the expanse from the dry land. He created the oceans and the seas and the dry land in a day. And he could have done exactly the same here in, in Genesis chapter 8. He could have brought Noah's ordeal to an end in an instant. But he didn't. He let him stay cooped up. In that dark confines of the dark confines of the ark, watching his depleting supplies for 11 whole months. Why? Why did he take so long to dry up the floodwaters and release Noah and his family from the ark? You know, after, after 40 days, after all the, the floodwaters had, had done the job, had they not, for which it had been sent? You know, to, to judge the, the wicked, kill off the, the rest of rebellious humanity. Why? Why put his child Noah through the, this elongated ordeal? Why? Because he had things to accomplish in Noah's life, lessons for Noah to learn that couldn't be accomplished by bringing a flood to an end in an instant. And it's the same with all the storms that God brings into his people's lives. God does things in his own time. The only timetable that God works to is his timetable, his own. And sometimes the floodwaters he sends are flash floods. They're here one minute and they're gone the next. But other times, as with Noah, the storms he sends are prolonged agonizingly prolonged we're forced to cope with them for a long long period of time and in those storms in our human nature we, we ask God we cry why why God why are you allowing me to, to suffer for so long months years you know we could end this in an instant you you know we looked at this par a few moments ago God, you have all the power in the world. You could bring this to an end in an instant if you wanted to. Why don't you? Why? Because God has lessons in those storms and purposes in those storms that wouldn't be learned, that can't be accomplished, wouldn't be accomplished by bringing them to an end quickly. So how are we to, to respond to prolonged storms? We see with a wonderful illustration here in the life of Noah how we're, we should respond to prolonged storms. Look at, at how Noah reacts to his prolonged imprisonment. He shows patience, wonderful patience. He doesn't reel at God. You know, we don't read of him criticizing God, denouncing God for what he's putting him through. He patiently waits on God and God's timing. He shows obedience. You know, as soon as he hears the hull of the ark scrape along uh, and ground itself in the mountains of Ararat, he's not up with his hammer, ripping off the roof of the ark, taking his axe to the door to, to, to get out. He waits obediently until God tells him it's time to leave. And he shows trust. Trusting God with his situation. Trusting him to fulfill the promises in his promises that he made to him in his time. Patiently, obediently, trustingly, waiting on God in the storm. And friends, that's how we are to respond to the storms of life. Whether flash floods, 
been and gone, or prolonged and drawn out storms, patiently, obediently, faithfully, trustingly, waiting on God to accomplish the purpose that he sent the storm to accomplish in the first place. Now, I don't want to give you the impression uh, this evening that it's, it's wrong, that it's somehow wrong to want hard, difficult times to end, that there's somehow, you know, we have to have a stiff upper lip and we have to, 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 to grin and, and bear it and, and get on with it. And God has sent this, so I'll just get on with it. And we have to be obedient. We have to be faithful. We have to trust. We have to be patient. And that's what I'm going to do. And however long this is going to be, well, well I'll just be obedient and, and patient. That, that's not the, the attitude that, that we're, we're called upon to show. It's not the attitude that, that Noah shows. It is not wrong to want your storms to end, to long for them to end. It's not incompatible with patient, obedient faith to want your storms to end, to plead with God, to bring them to an end. Yes, Noah was patient. Yes, he was obedient. Yes, he trusted God in the flood. But boy, did he want it to end. He wanted out of there. He wanted out of his little ark. Well, 40 days after the mountaintops were, were seen, a little over a month into his 11 months of, of, of prolonged captivity, God, he, what did he do? He took a raven, he took a dove, and he sent them out. Why? He wanted to know if the floodwaters were going down. When are we going to get out of here? Seven days later, uh, and, and then a, a week after that again, he sent the dove out again. He wanted to know how long it was going to be until the earth would be dry. When am I going to get out of here? He wanted the flood to be over. But in his longing, his anxiousness for the flood to be over, he waited on God patiently. He waited on God obediently. He waited on God trustingly. That's how we're to respond to the storms of life. God's program. God's personal involvement. God's power, God's program. The fourth thing that we, we learn here about coming through the waters from this chapter is God's purpose. God's purpose. And at this point, we've covered a bit of it. This point is, is closely, closely related to the last. God works to his own program, his own timetable. He sends prolonged storms into people's lives because he has a purpose in them, a purpose that wouldn't be accomplished in a little storm, a little flood. And what's true of, of, of big storms, huge storms, it, it's true too of, of, of little storms. Every storm that God sends into the lives of his people, he has a purpose. He has a reason for them. You know, he had a purpose for, for putting Noah, again, his child, his own child, through the, this, the, the, the horrendous ordeal of the flood. It, it wasn't arbitrary. You know, it wasn't on a whim. It wasn't thoughtlessly. It wasn't unthinkingly. It was done with a purpose for a reason. God had a, firstly, God had a purpose for the world in putting Noah through the flood. His purpose was to picture through Noah and, and his rescue and the ark, to, to picture the salvation that he would provide through Jesus Christ. That was part of God's purpose in sending Noah into this prolonged period. And, uh, floating in the ark. But God also had a purpose, many purposes for Noah uh, in putting him through the flood. Purposes that included proving his faith, um, strengthening his, his faith, developing in him characteristics and, and qualities that can only be, be developed in difficult situations. Patience, submission, obedience, Trust those, those qualities that, that Noah showed. God sent the, the flood to develop those more and more in his life, to develop humility, develop prayerfulness, develop his, his reliance, his, his dependence upon God, to see even more of the, the greatness and, and the wonder of God. And none of these reasons, well, they wouldn't have been immediately apparent to Noah. But nonetheless, they were there. God had a purpose, a reason for what he was doing. Purposes that were ultimately for Noah's good. And again, friends, it is the same. Exactly the same for all the storms that God brings into the lives of his people. 
He has a purpose. God always has a reason. And we may not be able to see his purposes like most of the time. We are blind to God's purposes, but he always has one. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. He always has a purpose. And it's always, always, always a good one. It's always for our good, as Paul reminds us in, in Romans 8, 20. And whether it, it's developing in us qualities that can only be developed in, in difficult situations, whether it's equipping us for, for acts of service that we, having come through a difficult situation, can, can, can pass on the comfort that, that we received in that difficult situation to others who, who are going through it after us, whether it's simply bringing us, us closer to himself, deepening our relationship with himself, he always has a purpose, a good one. What you're facing right now, tonight, tomorrow in the office, God planned it. And before the beginning of time, as he did the sermon tonight, he has a purpose for it, a good purpose. Remember that, rest in that. And we're told even to rejoice in that. God's purpose, God's personal involvement, God's power, God's program, God's purpose. The fifth thing that we see here in this storm is God's provision. God's provision. God, oh, we see here God's provision for Noah in the storm in so many wonderful ways. You know, he provided him with the ark um, that, that brought him through the flood, first and, and foremostly. He provided him with promises, promises that he and his family would be kept safe. They would come through the flood unscathed. He provided him with, with encouragement. After 150 days, the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. Uh, 40 days later, when he, when he looked out his little window, the, the tops of the mountains were seen. And whenever he sent out the, the, the dove, it come back with, with a, an olive branch in its mouth. Seven days later, it didn't come back at all. All of those were God's little encouragements to Noah. Keep on trusting. Keep on trusting. He provided him with rest in the midst of the storm. Can you imagine after, after um, what was it, 40 days? Um, it was 150 days. 150 days uh, on the, tossed about in the, in the flood waters. And suddenly, he heard this creak, and that rocking ark came to rest on the mountain of Ara. Rest in the very midst of the flood. And all, all of those, all four of, of those little huge provisions, God makes for all of his people in every storm of life. He's provided the ultimate ark, hasn't he? Jesus, who will bring us through every storm into his presence. He has given us a wealth, a wealth of promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will carry you. A little promise we looked at this time last year. No one will snatch you out of my hand. John, is it John 10? We, I think we looked at that on the first Sabbath day of the year. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and coming in for this time forth and forevermore. And that's just four. Four of, of the many, many promises he gives us in his word. He provides us with encouragement in the midst of storms. The encouragement that we find in his word. The encouragement that we find in fellowship with our fellow Christians. The encouragement of of seeing him preserve us and keep us every day. The encouragement of, of seeing what we see of, of his wonderful purpose has been worked out in our lives. Endless encouragement. And he gives us rest. Doesn't he? As he did with Noah in the midst of the storm, he gives us rest. A peace that surpasses all understanding, as Paul refers to it in Philippians. Peace that he gives us through his word, in prayer, fellowshipping with him, fellowshipping with his people. 
as we rest in him each Sabbath day and fix again our eyes on our great ark and our wonderful God. He gives us peace. God has made wonderful provision for his people in our storms. We just need to go to the store cupboard, don't we? And take those provisions off the shelves when we need them. God's provision. The sixth thing that we see here uh, and we learn about coming through the storms of, of life is God's preserving. God's preserving. In verse 18, having been told by God that it's now safe to, to leave the ark, Noah and his family, they step out onto to dry ground into the new world that God has created out of the elements of the old one. God, as he promised, brought Noah through the storm, bringing him safely to stand in that brand new world that he had created out of the elements of the old one. And the child of God can say exactly the same about every storm that he brings into our lives. God will preserve you through it. God will bring you through it. The storms of problems and pain and persecution and pressure, the storms of, of stress and sorrow and, and suffering, the stress of, of disease, devastation and death he will preserve you through them bring you through them all and maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself no he doesn't no he doesn't plenty of christians don't get better every christian every christian will die plenty of christians whose health deteriorates rather than improve we're all going to die, aren't we? And to that, yeah, I say, yes, you're right. But in all those situations, all those situations, God preserves his children, keeping them safe in him, keeping their faith in him, bringing them through them all to be with him and enjoy the brand new world that he one day will create out of the elements of this old one. Well, being a Christian doesn't guarantee an easy life. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that we will experience a storm-free life. It doesn't mean your storms will be short and easy. And it doesn't guarantee your storm will end this side of death. But it guarantees you will be preserved in them and through them to enjoy the glorious new world he will create one day out of the ashes of this old one. In the storms of life, child of God, remember that. Rest in that. Rejoice in that. God's preserving. The final thing that we see here about coming through the storms of life is God's praise. God's praise. Look with me at verse 20. Look down at, at verse 20 of chapter 8. We're told that Noah went out from the ark and he built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now just think of Noah. Think of, think of what's gone through his mind as he steps out of the ark. Can you imagine his to-do list? The things that he had to get done. I've got to find water, I've got to find, I've got to secure a food supply, I've got to get a house up before it gets dark, uh, I've got to look after these animals, I've got to make sure they're well looked after. You know, his to do list would have been enormous. But before he does anything else, any of these pressing, urgent things, he worships. He worships. Having been brought through the storm in the ark, Worshipping God took precedence. It took priority over everything else that he had to do. Thanking God. Praising God. Worshipping God. Adoring God. 
for his deliverance, for the wonderful new world that he had brought him into, for the ark that had brought him through the storm into this brand new world. And friends, Noah's priority should be our priority. As we come through the storms of life, as we anticipate being carried through the final storm of life, the ultimate storm of life, our great priority, the thing that should take precedence over everything else in our life, is worship of the great God who is personally involved with us and carries us through and provides for us and preserves us every minute of every day. Praising him. Thanking him for his acts of deliverance. Thanking him for the ark that provides ultimate deliverance. For the new world that we will one day experience through his deliverance. It should be our priority as it is now, today, at the start of every week. It should be your priority at the start of every day. It should be your priority in the midst of storms and coming out of storms and in preparation for facing the next storm. Delivered people should be light, should be people whose lives are marked by thankful worship for that deliverance and for their glorious deliverer. A little bit of challenge in a sermon that has had so much encouragement. Let's ask ourselves this evening, what does our attitude to worship say about our attitude to the deliverer and his deliverance? You know, how you feel on a Saturday night about the forthcoming Lord's Day, how you feel on a Sabbath morning as you prepare to come out morning and, and evening to, to, to worship. What is your attitude? What does our attitude to worship say about our attitude to the deliverer and his deliverance? God's praise. The lessons of this passage, and there's, there's more, there's more we could, we could study this passage for, for, for a few more weeks. These lessons of God's personal involvement, his power, his program, his purpose, his promises, his provision, his, his preserving. You know, being brought through all of these storms of life to, to sing God's praise. These lessons are important. And they're important for us because storms are a reality. You know they're a reality. We all know they're a reality. You know, in Florida, they have their, what is their, their hurricane season. In, in India, they have their, their monsoon season. But whatever you live in the world, wherever you live, life is one long storm season. One after another, after another. Difficulty, followed by hardship, followed by crisis, followed by chaos, followed by suffering, followed by, by, by sorrow, followed by death. But as God's children, you know, we have the assurance, this wonderful assurance through faith in Christ, all these assurances in all our storms, God walking alongside us, his personal involvement, exercising his power in those storms, his program. Yes, it may be long, but he has a purpose in it. God's, God's purpose is in all of them. God's provision in the midst of it. God's preserving through them all to be with him in a brand new world. And praise God. I, I, I quoted from Revelation 21 verse 1 earlier, earlier in the service, at the, the start of our sermon. Praise God that through Jesus Christ, we can look forward to a day that, and that new world where we're told in Revelation 21, where there'll be no more sea, be no more storms, no more chaos, no more, no more crisis, no more difficulties, no more pain. No more suffering, no more crying, no more mourning, no more death. Just perfect peace. Perfect eternal rest. Is that your assurance tonight? One more challenge for us. Is that your assurance tonight? All of you. Is that your confident hope? 
through faith in Christ, God's appointed way to enter this eternal rest? Is it your confident assurance that in all the storms of life, God is there helping, enabling, strengthening with a good purpose? Ultimately, we'll end in his presence. If it is, then in the storms of life, remember these truths. Rest in them and rejoice in them. But if it's not, and I would be a fool to think that everybody here this evening has put their faith in Christ. If you haven't, and you're trying to make your way through the storms of life, paddling your own canoe, as it were, then I want to be honest. I'm going to be brutally honest. You're going to sink. You're going to sink without a trace. On your own, without God, you're going to sink. And for you, eternity will be an unending, terrifying, brutal storm, of which the storm here in Genesis 7 and 8 is but a tiny fortieth. Tiny fortieth. And yet he holds himself out to you in this passage. He holds these wonderful assurances out to you in this passage. He holds his ark out to you. The one thing, the only thing, the only person that can bring you through the storms of life, every storm of life. These assurances can be yours, will be yours, if you would but only turn to that ark in faith and trust. Will you not today, this very evening, if you have not done so already, that these assurances would be yours? Amen.